Good morning and welcome to this, the last of Quadrant's London International Shipping Week breakfast forums. Thank you for coming along, uh, whether you're here with us in our Chambers Library uh, or you've joined us online. If you missed either of our earlier offerings, that was Monday's Charter Party Forum on new clauses for new risks, or Tuesday's new technologies and future risks, both will be available on our YouTube channel uh, very soon, along, I hope, with today's offering, a container ship special. Before introducing the topic, uh, I am delighted to be joined by Quadrant colleagues, Nicola Warrender QC, described in the directories as perhaps the hardest working human being that has ever lived, uh, and Nigel Cooper QC, Good morning. Uh, described more simply, but no less intimidatingly, uh, as absolutely magnificent. Uh, and we are deeply honored and very pleased to welcome Paul Dean, Global Head of Shipping at Holman Fenwick Willen, as the fourth member of our panel. Paul is, if I may respectfully say so, rightly praised in the directories for his enormous experience and knowledge in shipping and for being very clear, calm and thoughtful always trying to think outside of the box. Uh, and speaking of boxes, see what I did there? You don't need me to tell you that this has been one of the most astonishing years in the container trade. Uh, if I can pick out just four aspects which have generated headlines. First off, congestion and delay. Long Beach, LA, Yantian, Ningbo, Durban, LA, Long Beach. Container shortages, COVID, casualties, cyber attacks. It seems barely a week goes by without something adding to the general gumming up of the system. This is having real world consequences for charterers, carriers, cargo interests, consumers, and even Christmas. We are seeing an increased role being played in the market by major user, users such as Amazon, Walmart, and even Ikea both directly and as members of the new National Shipper Advisory Committee created by the US Federal Maritime Commission. And this is a development we can expect to stick, uh, see stick and gather pace, particularly as heavy users of shipping start to come under pressure to decarbonize their supply chain. Secondly, uh, the not unrelated return of the hot market. Despite or because of the increasing unreliability of the box trade, rates have been going through the roof. You'll all have read about the uh, $200,000 a day time charter earnings uh, that have been reported for a Euroseas Panamax box ship and CMA CGM surprise announcement last week that it was capping its spot rate increases for five months, leaving some to speculate that its Q4 bookings uh, are nearly full anyway. Just as it did in the 2005 hot market, these eye-watering sums are starting to spill over into disputes uh, between commercial parties uh, and to drive a new building ordering spree, the like of which we haven't seen since the heady days before the 2008 crash. Now, at some point in all of this, the music will stop, but then we've seen that before too. What is new this time, although it's been building for a while, is the interest that the US EU, Chinese, and Australian regulators, and even legislators uh, are showing in the workings of the market, its inefficiency and its cost, to say nothing, of course, of the impatience of the same regulators with uh, the IMO's relatively slow progress in decarbonization. Thirdly, casualties. We could hardly have a container ship special without mentioning the ever given, but you'll have to contain your disappointment that that's all we are going to do, mention it. We also need to mention the well-publicized container losses in the Pacific at the start of this year, a topic that Jai Sharma of Clyde Co addressed at Tuesday's breakfast forum. And of course, the, the dreadful fire uh, on the Express Pearl and the even more dreadful pollution that followed it. There is no doubt that the enormous variety of cargo and the vast number of boxes that can be carried on increasingly huge ships do combine to multiply the risks of carriage. Multiple questions arise. Should class be approving these ever larger designs? 
just how much due diligence can be exercised when accepting a sealed box for shipment? Is the reported response of some lines of refusing to carry chemicals a helpful or sustainable one? How well is the salvage industry configured to cope with casualties involving uh, the largest container carriers? Finally, technology. As we continue to wait for the Yara Berkeland to wow us with its uh, automation, the Chinese last week announced their own first autonomous box ship, the Zhifei. That may have prompted this week's announcement by US longshoremen uh, that they would refuse to handle cargo carried on autonomous ships. The, or perhaps one difficulty with that approach is that it will surely accelerate the adoption of the already maturing technology for the automation of box handling at terminals. You will all have heard and may have watched the video of the fully automated box bay container storage system at DP World's Jebel Ali terminal. The direction of travel uh, on this is clear. Of course, with the increasing involvement of technology comes risks. And that is the point on which we are going to dwell this morning. Paul Dean will outline for us some of the risks that cyber brings in its train. Nigel will then sketch a scenario that we will then analyze with our dispute disputes lawyers heads on, considering the contractual, safe port, and insurance angles before we head into a Q&A. So enough from me for now. Paul, over to you. James, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, good morning to everybody, and, and thank you also to Quadrant for inviting me to, to join this very august panel. This is uh, my opening slide. You'll see top left that there's a combined logo. Uh, HFW joined into a collaboration agreement with a company called CyberOwl uh, some months ago. And this presentation is a joint presentation by myself and the CEO of CyberOwl, uh, Daniel Ung. So what's happening uh, in relation to cyber? I've put a few things on the slide, which I hope you can see. Not Petya, I think uh, we're all familiar with what happened to Maersk. There are various figures which have been published in relation to that. I've just put one of those up there, a very significant figure. CMA, CGM, who we've heard already mentioned this morning by James, two weeks of disruption in relation to the attack on, on them. The IMO themselves, I was at the IMO on Monday. They have also suffered as a result of a cyber attack. I think the next bullet point is very significant indeed. We're looking at incidents, one incident on a ship every day. A large amount of these are not reported. Also, in terms of how this is all increasing, you'll see the statistic in relation to how the percentage was going up to 2020, 900%. This is really increasing. It's very significant. Next, in terms of ransomware attacks, one every 10 seconds, every 10 seconds. I mean, this is, these are staggering, staggering figures. In terms of what's actually happening, there's a whole range of things from spoofing. You may have seen recently what happened in relation to uh, HMS Defender. And then also we've seen examples of ethical hackers actually taking control of the bridge of a ship. And then last but not least, I've left on there the, the quote from Lloyd's List some months ago. So in terms of container ships, particularly in their own vulnerability, um, they do have some vulnerability, which is greater than you would see on traditional tonnage. And I put on there for the, the, the first point in relation to cargo management systems. And I was reading this morning in relation to the, the report on the Golden Ray and what happened there. That could easily happen in relation to a container ship through a cyber attack. Reefers and the, uh, the pressurized containers which are carried, equally they can be vulnerable. I think in terms of reefers, food, hackers are not going to be particularly interested in that. But you could see the potential in relation to chemicals and dangerous goods. Many years ago, I worked on a case called the Capitan Sakharov, a container ship. And one of the arguments in that case was whether um, containers of isopentane had been stored in the wrong place and had heated. So you could see a stowage plan being altered through a cyber attack and containers being put in the wrong place. 
But the bigger issue, I think, is a commercial one. You've got tight turnaround times in ports, so less time to perhaps remediate. And as James has already said in relation to the costs, the costs of delay are enormous. Regulation, seaworthiness and risk. So just starting with seaworthiness, I think we're probably all familiar with the, the general rules in relation to seaworthiness and the exercise of due diligence. Cyber is an aspect of that in the same way as ISM is. The ISPS code, I think we were reminded at the weekend, the 20th anniversary of 9-11, ISPS code was introduced in order to deal with the maritime issues or potential issues in relation to a 9-11 equivalent involving a ship. Is that code sufficient? I don't think it is. It wasn't introduced in order to address that cyber. We, of course, have IMS, sorry, IMO MSC 428, which was brought into effect at the beginning of this year. Is compliance on its own enough? I would suggest not, in the same way that a vessel being in class does not mean that the vessel is seaworthy. But I think more importantly is the commercial risk. We need to be looking for protection against the key financial exposures, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. And I'll come back to contracts in a moment. So what are the solutions? And there are solutions. They're, they're front end and also at the back end. So in relation to undertaking a maritime uh, cybersecurity review, you'll see the various elements to that. And just touching for the moment on legal, <coughs> one of the elements I think in relation to legal is that parties need to be looking at their contracts. And I don't just mean looking at charter parties and introducing cyber clauses, for example, which we will touch upon, but everybody needs to be looking at their supply contracts. Can they perhaps pass on liabilities that they're incurring in relation to cyber risk to, for example, their suppliers? These things need to be looked at. OT and IT, operational technology and information technology, these things need to be reviewed. There are high risk systems on container ships. We mustn't also forget data. If data is released, there is potential for very significant fines under GDPR, for example. And then last, uh, sorry, not last but not least, penultimately, onboard cybersecurity monitoring. This is one of the things that uh, CyberAL uh, do. And it's one of the things that uh, um, is one of the additional points that in our um, collaboration with them, we're able to offer to the client so that we can cover the full risks in relation to cyber on board vessels. And then last but not least, however well protected ships are, and every effort will be made to make ships safe, there is a real risk that there will be a breach. People need to be prepared for when breach take place, they will take place. So to conclude, um, this is not the fiction of James Bond movies. I'm a bit of a James Bond fan. There was a film called Tomorrow Never Dies, which featured uh, cyber on board a ship. The risks are real, and if they're not keeping you awake at night, they should do. But the good news is there are solutions. Thank you. So thank you very much, Paul, uh, for that very illuminating presentation. Uh, we'll stay in the realms of fiction for the moment, uh, albeit not James Bond, uh, but hopefully a slightly different scenario. Uh, and, and I'm just going to try and outline in pictures uh, the scenario that hopefully you've all been provided with, uh, which, although it is fictional, represents the type of incident that is and almost certainly will occur some in, in the future. Uh, so we have here our vessel, the, uh, the, mo the container ship, lots of stuff, which is a 20,000 TU vessel. Uh, she's coming into uh, the high-tech port, uh, and I very unimaginatively called that Port A, uh, but it's, uh, and the vessel's operating on a high-speed liner service, uh, under, uh, but operated on a high-speed liner service by Containers for U Limited. Now, in an attempt to portray what happens when she arrives, oh, before we do that, so these are the series of contractual relationships that are important to, to have in mind. 
The vessel is owned by Big Investments Limited. She's on a bare boat charter to bare boat limited, uh, and then time chartered on an NYPE form to containers for you. Containers for you have entered a vessel sharing agreement, uh, allowing allotting 25% of the slots on board to Boxes R Us, a related company. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that none of the charter parties, none of the agreements, uh, actually incorporated the BIMCO Cybersecurity Clause 2019. Uh, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. So when the vessel arrived at the port, a number of things happened. Uh, an engineer came on board to, to undertake some routine servicing. And in the course of his work, uh, he, uh, uh, first of all, connected his computer to the vessel's uh, cargo handling computer. Uh, but because he also needed to undertake some printing, uh, he gave the chief officer a USB stick, which that chief officer then uh, put into the ship's business printer systems uh, and business computer uh, in order to use the printer. Now, at this point, the master has been informed by email from the port authorities that he's about to be subject to port state control. And uh, he advises the terminal of that fact by email. Now, shortly thereafter, the chief officer discovers that the business IT system has frozen and that a ransomware note appears on the screen. Uh, making various demands of the ship, which he reports to the master. By this time, of course, the vessel's cargo handling systems have also uh, collapsed, uh, and none of the cargo managing functions are uh, working. All state control detain the vessel at the berth, uh, because of the cyber incident, uh, which is actually just as well, because by this time the uh, terminal's in a bit of a crisis too, uh, because her computers are now down, its computers are now down, and all the cargo handling equipment, the computer controlled chariots, there aren't yet any autonomous ships in this port, but lots of automation on, on shore, um, cannot be used to take any unloaded containers to their designated storage space. Uh, at this point, although it's bound to come, the terminal hasn't yet received a ransomware note, but it has had four similar incidents within the last month uh, when it has received ransomware notes in, in a very similar format to the one now displayed on the ship's computer. Uh, so all in all, it's gone wrong on board the vessel, it's gone wrong in the terminal, uh, and by this time, of course, there are now ships lining up outside, all waiting for the berths to come available that they should be loading on if in order or unloading at in order to keep up with their schedule. Uh, what is, in terms of the blame game that has now started, the owners and bare boat charters are blaming containers are, uh, for you for sending the vessel to an unsafe port or terminal. The terminal and port are blaming the vessel uh, for not only delaying discharging operations, but, but infecting and crashing the terminal computer systems via the email from the master. Uh, the terminal is offering to make alternative arrangements to transport containers when unloaded, but only if they get letters of indemnity uh, in respect of the additional costs uh, the boxes for us, the liner service, the vessel sharing arrangement partner, are blaming containers for you for failing to do its due diligence before chartering the vessel. Uh, and again, also demanding that alternative arrangements are made so that uh, discharge can be made to the bill of lading holders. Uh, and as I say, there are already vessels at Anchorage uh, and vessels en route who are expecting to come into the port. Uh, we should, of course, say just by way of closing on this scenario that there's no time frame yet fixed for when it will come to an end. And it's with that that I think I hand over to Nicola. I feel this is like this 
feeding time bomb coming my way. So I'm going to look at a little more detail at the sorts of parties and the contracts which are affected by a cybersecurity incident on board a container vessel, as Nigel's just outlined in this scenario. Just to pair back, some of the detail. I'm going to start by looking at the internal interests. And what I mean by that are those parties who have the most direct interest in what has happened aboard the container vessel, lots of stuff. And rather like the name of the vessel, you can see from the slide, there's lots of parties and there's lots of contracts that we need to consider. And those are just some examples of the key parties and contracts that you tend to find in containerized carriage. You can have intermediate time charter parties at the top of the chain and towards the bottom of the chain, as um, James alluded to earlier, some of well-known household names have longer term service agreements with liners if they don't now charter the vessel themselves. And so you won't just find them holding their one bill of lading per container for the whole Amazon or Walmart deliveries. But for today's purposes, I feel that's more than enough for us to consider. Before we delve into the detail for some of the layers here, I just want to highlight a few general issues that this overall scheme of contracts creates. First of all, significant number of parties, as I've already said, more parties mean there are more problems. We also here have more parties who play a dual role than in the traditional charter chains that we see in other forms of um, tonnage. So they're having to protect their interests both upwards and down the chain. And that's made more difficult because you'll see in um, purple, the types of contracts that they have are not in the same form in each tier. And so the manner in which each of these contracts deal with the risks of cyber incident or the consequent damage or delay caused is not going to be the same either. And then just to top it off, how they have um, allegate, allegate, sorry, allocated those risks are different, but also how the parties have chosen to resolve any disputes under the contracts are different. So you'll find different governing laws and different dispute resolution clauses in them. So it's fair to say that container shipping starts off with a complex contractual chain, and that's before we look at each individual layer in this chain. So with those general points in mind, let's look at some of the ways in which this cyber incident is going to affect these parties and their contracts and what we might find in those contracts which deal with the risks. I'm going to start with a cargo interest claim so at the very bottom of the slide. And one of the most complicated aspects is the potential for carriage of containers on board on the same ship to be completely subject to different terms and conditions. And that's because we don't have ordinarily owner's bills for each box that's carried, but we have various container liner company terms. And anyone who's ever done a container ship case will have done that laborious process of doing a schedule where you're trying to match up everyone's container with the various container lines, which governs the contractual relationship. So there's many different varieties, but a few common features to watch out for. Again, we have the problem with differing applicable law and jurisdiction clauses. Um, you will often find US COGSA, Hague, Hague Visby rules. That's no surprise. I've yet to come across one which voluntarily offers up for Hamburg rules. But in this scenario, the goods haven't suffered loss and damage. If they had, it would be quite straightforward. We have the Hague, Hague Visby or US COGSA supplemented by duties and bailment. In our scenario, what we have uh, is delay, and the Hague and Hague Bisbee rules don't touch on this matter. The Hamburg rules would, but as I say, they're not often incorporated. And whilst containers for you and boxes are us may be keen to advertise those high speed liner services, it's quite another thing for them to offer up that they are going to guarantee delivery so that your container is going to arrive there on time. So what I suggest you find as a common feature in liner bills is liberty clauses permitting what might otherwise be considered unacceptable delays or even express clauses which say in terms 
that the carrier does not undertake that the goods will be arriving at the port of discharge or at any place of delivery at any particular time or to meet any particular market. So in terms of delay, the risk is stacked against the ordinary bill of lading holder. Um, but that's not to say that they're not going to be affected by cyber incidents. Um, Paul mentioned um, GDPR, and it is worthwhile mentioning that some of the container line incidents that we've seen already have been reported cyber incidents involving their booking processes or their websites. And that is a real concern for um, the parties booking, um, and, and that's where we might see some exposure um, from those cyber incidents. Not our scenario, but not a million miles away from what we can all imagine. So going up a tier, what about um, claims under the vessel sharing agreement in our scenario? Well, vessel sharing agreements are bespoke contracts. And so it's all going to depend on the precise terms of the agreement between containers for you and boxes for us. But a couple of points worth noting. As Nigel mentioned, they're often related parties or they're long-term alliances between container shipping lines. So they don't want to be falling out internally every time there's a container ship issue. What they want in their vessel sharing agreements is a contractual mechanism whereby either the container line who owns the vessel, which is an R scenario, or the container line that is the time charterer compensates the other VSA partners, and then they pass that loss up the chain. And the types of losses that the VSA partners suffer needn't be limited to the exposure that they themselves face under the bills of lading. Now, they might well be confident they're going to defeat these claims for delay. That doesn't mean they're not going to have some exposure or suffer loss. What about the lawyer's fees? What about those jurisdictions where the winning party doesn't get their costs? That's a loss. At a practical level, some of them may own the containers which are now stuck on board. They may find they're not discharged for some time. They might have loss of container demurrage. They might find the containers are in completely the wrong place, not at the right place at the right time, and they've got other cargo at other ports waiting. And what about the reputational damage? They're all claiming to operate this high-speed liner service, and as um, James mentioned, even my mother can now mention some of the container line <laughs> names because she reads about them every day in the newspaper while she's waiting on her Amazon delivery. So it's not unusual, particularly in vessel sharing agreements, for there to be a bespoke regime which deals with these sorts of delays and losses for spe specific events. What I haven't come across yet is a vessel sharing agreement which deals specifically with cyber security incidents as a separate provision from what Paul mentioned, seaworthiness and ISM compliance or the general duties that we see warranties of vessels used to provide the line of services. But as this is the tier where delay is probably going to be felt the most commercially and operationally, I would say watch this space. They may not introduce the cybersecurity clause from VIMCO, which is designed for um, charter parties, but I would expect this feature of cybersecurity to feature in the future negotiations for VSEs. So looking up the chain again towards a time charter, now this in our scenario takes a standard form of NYPE, but because of the nature of the charter as business business, containers for you, we can expect to see some contractual modifications in the rider clauses to try and allocate risk, as Paul mentioned, for delay more on the um, bare boat charterers rather than it being held by containers for you or, um, and they want to pass it up the chain. So we quite often see bespoke off-hire provisions. Again, I've not seen one which deals specifically with cybersecurity clauses, but why couldn't we have one suitably drafted? Um, we have the ordinary seaworthiness maintenance obligations that Paul touched on, and we also have the cybersecurity clause from BIMCO 2019, or a similar bespoke provision, which isn't in our scenario, but which we are seeing now in more time charter parties in containerized shipping. 
So I set that um, BIMCO cybersecurity clause out in later slides. Um, a colleague of ours spoke about that um, this clause earlier this week. The important features are to notice is that it places an obligation on both parties. So if it were in the time charter, containers for you and Bebo Limited are going to have to comply with the obligations. There is a reasonable endeavours obligation to um, that any third parties who are servicing in this contract, um, that people have done their due diligence on them. And it has a limitation, which by default is $100,000. Well, one can see we may well have more than $100,000 worth of exposure here. And an option to break the limits in the case of gross negligence or willful misconduct. So if you are going to introduce a cybersecurity clause and you are a cont container line operator, you're going to want that limit to be increased. There's not much really to say about a bare boat charter, but before I hand over, you'll recall that I started saying by looking, we're looking at the internal interests, but it's obvious from our scenario that the ramifications of a cyber incident go beyond that. And with container shipping, time really is money and not just for those with internal interests in the vessel. On this slide, you'll see a number of external interests which can be affected under our scenario. And whilst it might not be unusual to find some of these interests um, affected in similar incidents where we've got other tonnage, I think the sheer number of parties who can be affected and the types of contract, the variety of contracts can be affected are something which is unique to containerized shipping and why containerized shipping in particular needs to be very aware of the cyber incidents that may occur. I can pass on to James, who's going to deal with you, the unsafe you can keep the, keep the clicker on your table, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, unsafe, the unsafe port uh, angle of this, and uh, one wonders um, quite what Lord Justice Sellers would have made of it all. His classic statement of the law in the Eastern City uh, is still 63 years on the starting point for any unsafe port claim. The very first container shipment in history had only taken place two years before the Court of Appeal heard argument uh, in the Eastern City. Uh, and the development and 21st century sophistication and challenges of the container trade would have been beyond imagination in 1958. Even so, it is pretty striking that his formulation can still be applied at all uh, in today's world. Now, for those uh, who have not committed it to memory, uh, his formulation runs like this. A port will not be safe unless, in the relevant period of time, the particular ship can reach it, use it, and return from it without, in the absence of some abnormal occurrence, being exposed to danger, which cannot be avoided by good navigation and seamanship. Let's repeat that last bit, being exposed to danger, which cannot be avoided by good navigation and seamanship. Now, on our scenario, three questions arise, always assuming that there's a, an unsafe port, uh, a safe port obligation in the relevant contract. So one is really looking at the time charter here. The first question is this, what would owners say is the danger to which the vessel was exposed when it was ordered to the port? Well, a risk of cyber attack? Well, that risk exists everywhere at all times whenever one computer is connected to another, whether directly or via the internet uh, or a USB stick. So owners would have to do better than that. Uh, an enhanced risk of cyber attack, perhaps, well, maybe, but enhanced how, and by reference to what feature of the port? Hmm. Enhanced because the port had had four very similar previous attacks. Well, that's starting to sound more promising, but to make this good, owners will need to show that there's something in the port setup that was wanting, the cyber equivalent of the uncharted reef. It's at this point that owners will inevitably bump up against the problem that so often bedevils unsafe port claims, which is the 
perfectly understandable unwillingness of the port to make available the evidence which owners need to make good their claim against the charterers. Uh, now, that was a serious problem in the ocean victory, where records of the long waves and storms which affected the port were very hard to come by. Needless to say, uh, in our scenario, factual investigation and expert evidence will be critical in the articulation and establishment uh, of a relevant danger. But let's suppose we can overcome that and formulate a reasonably convincing danger to which the vessel was exposed. The second question is whether this was a danger that could have been avoided by good navigation uh, or seamanship. Well, I think we can all agree that no amount of good navigation would have helped avoid whatever it was. But what about good seamanship? Is reasonable cybersecurity a facet of the 21st century seafarer? Now, one could have an argument about that, uh, and one shivers to think what some elder brethren would make of a question on cyber precautions put to them by the Admiralty judge. But I think we can be quietly confident that cybersecurity is a, a facet of good, good seamanship. Just a riff on that for a moment. The, um, of course, for fans of Wilbur Smith and Hungry as the Sea, which for many of us was our uh, introduction to the romance of, of shipping, you remember the trog, the radio officer, who could monitor three frequencies in a drugged sleep uh, and was a dab hand with a telex, all things which have more or less disappeared. Uh, of course, radio officers are no longer a thing. Um, many of them, and we can be grateful to them because lots of collisions resulted, retrained as third officers. Uh, but they, the radio officer has passed into history. But, but is there a, 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 an increasing case for, as it were, reinventing uh, the radio officer as the ship's IT officer. Um, that's uh, a discussion for another day, but I just throw that out there. Um, it, even, if, even if cybersecurity isn't seamanship in the strict sense, we only need to remind ourselves that this is a, a clause in a contract that allocates risk. The allocation of the risk of an unsafe port to the charterer presupposes that the features which might make that port unsafe are not such as can be avoided by precautions and behavior that are reasonably to be expected of the ship owner and its crew. And at this point, we all have to turn back to our expert on maritime cybersecurity and the new cybersecurity section of the ship's SMS, which it now has to have. Was that section good enough? Did the crew comply with it? How likely is it that the ransomware attacks came through the visiting engineer? Looks likely, but can we be sure? Uh, and so on. And of course, in all of this, we must not lose sight of the rather slippery concept of the abnormal occurrence. Was this just one of those things for which charterers cannot be taken to have assumed the risk, like an earthquake in San Francisco, for example? This is even harder to answer in the abstract than what the danger in this case uh, might have been, and so I'm, I'm going to take the moral coward's way out and not to try. So in conclusion, one would have to say that an unsafe port claim is conceivable here, but as with so many cases, it will face formidable evidential challenges. Uh, and with that, I will hand on to Nigel, who is going to talk about the insurance angle. Nigel. Thank you, James. Your mention of the telex makes me remember, reminds me that when I first joined Chambers, there used to be a telex machine in the clerk's room. Uh, we've rather moved on from that, and I kind of wonder whatever happened to it. Uh, but, but as Paul, Nicola, and James have just outlined, the fallout from an incident like this, like the one described in our scenario, can be huge in terms of both the cost and indeed the time required to resolve the very varying liabilities that can arise. Now, clearly, much of that burden uh, will be borne by the different insurance interests involved. But simply identifying those interests in itself may not be straightforward, let alone unpicking the impact of any relevant limitations on cover, exclusions, or the impact of measures such as loss prevention clauses. In addition, container shipping throws up a particular issue uh, that can arise in relation not just to this type of incident, but, but, but other incidents that arise at container terminals. 
uh, where you have a container line uh, that also has associated cargo handling facilities at the terminal, uh, also may have uh, its own onward distribution service, uh, and may therefore, in relation to those operations, have a, a, a variety of policies that apply, each of which have their own joint assured provisions, each of which may have their own provisions relating to double insurance, uh, and clauses that either limit or exclude liability depending on the presence of other covers uh, that may be there to respond to the incident. Uh, and as incurred in relation to a case I was dealing with the other year, you may even have a situation where the container line involved doesn't actually know which policies it has which respond to that the, the incident uh, and therefore what its levels of cover actually are. Um, <clears throat> so those are some of the general issues that, that, that may arise. Looking at our scenario, uh, in a sense, in the same way that Nicola was looking at what are the contractual relationships engaged, one of the first questions that's going to arise is whose insurance covers are engaged? Uh, and just looking at the incident, the following would seem to be the most likely uh, and the most obvious. Uh, first of all, of course, the most obvious risk to the containers is that of delay. But depending how long the incidents arise, uh, there may also be questions of damage, uh, particularly, for example, if the incident uh, affects reefer containers. Um, and so therefore, you're looking at the cargo insurers uh, and indeed the insurers for the cargo container lessors uh, and their owners. <clears throat> then, of course, you have the terminal interests, uh, the port operator and authority, uh, the insurers for any cargo handling equipment facilities with premises and equipment at the terminal, uh, and the, inter the insurers engaged are likely to be their liability and property insurers. The vessel itself, uh, one's first instinct might well be that the, the, the cover that's most likely to be engaged is the P&I cover. But of course, depending on the extent of the damage done to the ship's systems by the cyber attack, uh, you may also be looking at their hull and machinery cover. Uh, in, in our scenario, it, it would seem most likely that it's going to be the demise charter as cover that is principally engaged. Um, but that may, of course, depend on the shape and place of any claim uh, advanced by the terminal or container interests. Charterers liability insurers, another port of call. <clears throat> Boxes are us liability insurers, possibly also if they own the containers or any of the containers on board or lease them, uh, their cover for uh, the lease and hire, uh, ownership of those containers, their, their property or delay insurers. Depending on the carriage arrangements for the containers, onward carriage uh, arrangements for the containers, there may also be questions for the liability insurers of freight forwarders, liner agents, or distributors. Uh, and <clears throat> the one that might be, might be on board that doesn't typically arise in relation to a, an unsafe port incident or a, an incident like this is the uh, liability insurers of the engineers' employers. Uh, might be interesting questions there about the limits of liability limits on his cover on on their cover, but 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 certainly a port of call, as it were, worth looking at. Now that deals with the interest directly in, engaged in the incident, but it's also, of course, worth keeping in mind that we have three vessels waiting offshore uh, at the anchorage and more looking to arrive all the time. And if the terminal is shut down for any period of time. Uh, there will be cargo receivers and shippers who are unable to collect or deliver the cargo. And all of those will have insurers uh, who may be responding to this incident uh, and looking also then to make a recovery from other insurers. In terms of the risks engaged, uh, loss and damage uh, <clears throat> to the containers and their contents, uh, losses directly through delay while the terminal is shut down. Uh, but of course, you may also have issues relating to containers being lost, uh, quite likely in the, in the context of this kind of incident, if uh, the terminal's information systems are shut down, that they may lose containers for a while, 
or completely, uh, or indeed the containers being misdirected and onward shipped to somewhere that they were never intended to go to in the first place. Who's going to pay to recover them and get them back to their original destination? Uh, damage to the terminal equipment and infrastructure. Uh, as James pointed out, at many container terminals now, you have an increasing degree of automation and, and therefore a, uh, an increasingly high spend on handling equipment uh, and, and the systems, the software systems required to operate them. Damage to the vessel itself that I've already mentioned. Uh, the liability insurers throughout the chain. Uh, we've already heard in terms of the scenario and how James has described uh, how the unsafe port claim might, might operate, that, 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 that certainly liability, there'll be liability questions arising as to whether it was an unsafe port or indeed whether or not the vessel was at fault uh, because of the actions of, of the, the chief officer putting the, uh, allowing the engineer access to the ship's computer systems. And then of course, possible business interruption, depending on the consequences of the incident. And in this context, issues may arise too, uh, if, the, if that business interruption cover is linked to loss and damage of physical assets, has that loss or damage occurred? Some, cover, some covers offer cover in respect of uh, business interruption caused linked to birth obstruction. But if the policy requires a physical obstruction of the birth, is the fact that the vessel cannot move off the birth going to be sufficient to engage the cover? And of course, there's the practical problem that Nicola has already mentioned, which is given the scope for third party claims, it may be difficult to keep all the claims in one jurisdiction. Uh, and it may therefore, or, or indeed under one system of law. So you may well be looking at claims handlers that are dealing with a multi-jurisdictional situation. Uh, and as Nicola says, someone somewhere producing huge schedules, trying to keep a track of what claim is where and how and when it has been resolved. And it's not unusual in the container ship scenario for, I certainly got incidents running where I was first engaged 10 years ago. And it's only now that the liability issues between insurers that can be resolved because in the meantime, they've had to resolve cargo claims elsewhere that have taken this length of time to run through the courts. So what are some of the specific issues that might arise in relation to the insurance cover at first, first of all? The major one is likely to be, is there cover for cyber risk at all? Now, it may be within uh, the primary cover held by either the cargo insurer or the cargo interest or indeed the vessel. It's worth noting that most uh, IG group, P&I groups uh, do not exclude cover for cyber risk from their pollock, from their wordings, um, subject possibly to their war or terrorism exclusion. Some insurers exclude cyber, cyber risk uh, for, as a within your primary cover, but allow for the option of buyback. Others just completely exclude that risk. Uh, and so, of course, one of the first questions for any interest involved in this incident is, well, what cover do I actually have? Secondly, what is the definition of cyber risk or cyber attack? As far as I'm aware, there is not yet an industry standard definition of what is a cyber risk or a cyber attack. Now, if it's a ransomware attack, like as we have here, where the attack is directly related to the computer systems in use, then it would seem likely that that is going to fall within an ordinary definition of cyber attack, cyber attack, as would, for example, a situation where hackers enter a system and use the system to divert payments intended for the person whose system they've hacked. But what about the situation where the hackers take the data, do nothing more with the insured's computer systems, but having obtained the data, then use it to independently target other third parties. That might be, it might be rather more difficult to bring that situation within the definition of cyber attack or cyber risk, certainly on some of the wordings I've seen, which require 
an attack on the insured's computer systems causing loss. Now, where's the link? Is, is that a sufficiently close causative link if the data is used independently? What is the nature of the insured risk? I've certainly seen policies where there's cover for the performance of the insured services, but no cover in respect of deficiencies with systems or, or infrastructure. If an insured does not have in place adequate cyber protection, adequate protocols to protect their system, is that a question of a failure in the performance of the insured services if, if there's an attack as a consequence of those failures? Or is that a deficiency with the systems and infrastructure uh, that uh, is the, of, of the insured and therefore within the exclusion to cover? Um, and you may notice that I'm not answering many of these questions, and that, that is, there's deliberate reasons for that, because some of them are questions that uh, are, are live. Um, loss prevention clauses. Uh, we, we've heard from James and from Paul and from Nicola about the measures being taken by IMO and BIMCO to enforce uh, better cybersecurity on board vessels. Uh, and, and the requirement that the SMS is going to, that you have to have cybersecurity uh, covered within your SMS, within a ship's SMS. Um, but what we haven't yet seen, or at least I certainly haven't seen so far, are specific loss prevention clauses in insurance policies that deal with the requirement for cyber security uh, and the need for adequate pro um, measure <coughs> controls and protocols to be in place. Um, but of course, we're all aware that certainly most PI policies, uh, or most policies, have lo general loss prevention clauses uh, requiring. Um, compliance with measures to protect assets, <clears throat> excuse me, the use of best endeavors to reduce or avoid risks. Can these clauses be used uh, to uh, limit or exclude cover for a claim in circumstances where uh, the failure relates to a failure to have, a, have adequate cybersecurity measures in place? On the face of it, there wouldn't seem to be any reason why not. Uh, but we will have to wait and see. Causation. If your ships and containers are not the subject of the cyber attack itself, but, 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 but you're, you, the insured, suffer damage or delay due to a cyber attack, and, and there is a cyber attack exclusion, is there cover if, you have, if, that, if the insured has not been the direct subject of the cyber attack? What is the causative link? Um, and, and in that context, of course, we'll all be familiar with the interesting discussion of causation uh, and, and the possible expansion to the notion of causation that we find in the, the recent decision in, the, uh, in FCA and ARCH. So those are just some of the questions that are going to arise uh, in, in the context of insurance issues arising out of an incident like the one we've disclosed. Uh, James has mentioned autonomous shipping, and that's a whole raft of further questions relating to insurance cover that I suspect we haven't got time for today. Um, but of course, if your cover has question re requirements for issues like safe manning within them or, or safe crewing, then uh, autonomous shipping might raise. Uh, that might be a first question to, to answer in relation to autonomous shipping. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's over back to you now, Nicola, isn't it? Yes, well, you posed enough questions that I'm here to answer God's questions. Ah, and I think you're going to answer them. We expect answers now. We expect answers. If anyone who's watching this do, do, um, has a question, then please send it in. And it's being relayed to me on WhatsApp, that very technical way that we have. We already have some questions. If anyone in the audience has any questions, then raise your hand and I will try to see you. It's not many years, so I should be, be able to spot if you have a burning question that you want to answer. And we've had some in already. Um, the scenario that we had obviously has um, a ship in port waiting, one waiting already and others arriving. Um, the theme for the London International Shipping Week this year is very much focused on clean shipping and how the industry is addressing climate change. So 
Or how do you see that cyber risks fit into that theme? It's a very good question. <laughs> very good question. And I think it's not just about fuel. Um, for those of us who were at the IMO on Monday for the launch of the, uh, the two films that they did, there is very much an industry focus on collaboration in relation to, to reaching zero emissions in 2050. In relation to answering this specific question, I think one of the elements or one of the ways in which shipping is going to need to get to uh, zero emissions is through the increasing use of digitalization and automation. And through that requires more connectivity. And through more connectivity, you're going to get more risk uh, in relation to cyber. So even more risks than we started off talking about. Lots of risks. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Sticking with the uh, fuel theme, we've had another question um, submitted in advance, which asks, does the container shipping industry run the risk of falling foul of competition regulators in looking to cooperate on the issue of alternate clean marine fuel uptake? And I think there's been a lot in the press about this recently, hasn't there, James? Uh, there has. I mean, I think I'd say three things about that. The first is I'm not a competition lawyer. Um, the, that was the disclaimer. In always case always get the it. disclaimer up. up not, up. not an immigration asylum lawyer either. <laughs> uh, the the second thing I would say is that that actually the container industry as a whole is at the moment going uh, in two different directions. So far as um, alter, what are called alternative fuels are concerned, one sees that CMA CGM, uh, for example, is particularly heavily invested in LNG. Now, one could have quite a lively debate as to really how green LNG is. My personal view is it, it's actually a, a retrograde step, if anything. But uh, um, CMA, CGM obviously takes a different view. Maersk, on the other hand, uh, is going long on biomethanol uh, and uh, ammonia, uh, which are uh, two very interesting uh, developments. Um, and the, the third thing that I would say is that I think the concern of competition regulators is more immediately focused on just how expensive uh, container shipping has become. Uh, and the, the real interest of the regulators is, is on that at the moment uh, and not on what would actually be a, a, a much more beneficial um, collaboration in terms of trying to identify uh, what um, portfolio of, of greener fuels uh, the, the industry is going to need uh, in the decades to come. Can I just add yes, something? Sure. It, it really it stems out of what I was hearing a lot on Monday evening. The C word collaboration came up a lot in relation to how the industry is going to respond to this. So I think that for the moment is, is more the focus rather than perhaps the competition issue. Um, we're moving away now from pure back to insurance, Nigel. We've had a question in um, about the war and terrorism exclusions that you mentioned. So are the traditional constructions of those sorts of exclusions fit for purpose with regard to cyber insurance policies? I think the short answer to that question is, is probably no, because if you're looking to exclude cover for cyber attack or cyber risk, doing so by, risk, by reference to certainly the traditional types of war and terrorism uh, exclusions, uh, raises a number of difficult questions. First of all, where does the cyber attack actually originate or, or originate from? If it's purely an economic cyber attack, such as the type we've been discussing in the scenario, then it's going to be very difficult to, um, I would have thought, bring oneself within the traditional definitions of war, -like or, uh, war or warlike operations or terrorism. Uh, that, that one finds in most insurance policies where one requires uh, certainly state participation in if it's going to be a war or warlike act or a, a political purpose, for example, if it's going to be a terrorist act. Um, even if you, one can show state involvement, uh, there may then be a question as to whether or not the attack is for the type of reasons, purposes or operations that fall within a cyber, within a war or terrorism clause, war, te war, war risk or terrorism exclusion. Uh, for example, if the state, it is a state-sponsored activity, but it is for the, furthering the economic aims of that state's industries, 
is that going to be sufficient to bring the cyber attack within a, a war risk or terrorism clause? Now, now, no doubt we could occupy lots of days in the commercial court arguing about that. Uh, yay! <laughs> um, but, but that's not particularly going to assist the insured or indeed the insurer. And I think there's certainly a view out, well, I'm sure there's a view out there, that, 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 that particularly where you've got the, the risk of catastrophic cyber incidents, uh, one needs to have cyber risk clauses, both in terms of what cover is actually granted, but also in terms of what exclusions are going to operate that are clearly aimed at cyber risk rather than trying to leverage the issue within traditional clauses. <clears throat> uh, so, so that's my answer to that one. Um, but I think it's time for a question for you, isn't it, Nicola? Oh, okay. um, and I mean, I think it's something you've talked about a little bit already, but, but, but perhaps you'd like to just give us a bit more on, on how you think parties in our type of incident can, can deal contractually with cyber risk. Yes, well, I, I touched upon the um, the cyber risk clause, which is really designed to be inserted into um, charter parties. And just following on from your insurance aspects, I mean, one of the hopes in introducing such clauses is that the availability of insurance for cyber attacks will become more prevalent in the market. Whether that happens or not, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I think there is a slide on it maybe i can go back to it yeah so it's the bimco cyber security clause 2019 um, parties obviously don't have to use this clause if they don't want to there can be negotiation they can have a bespoke um provision in their contracts um but the intention really is to try and allocate risk for cyber security incidents um and for and put on the parties, both parties, as I mentioned, obligations with regard to um, good um, cybersecurity policies, really. So you see that they have to implement um, appropriate cybersecurity measures. They have to have in place appropriate um, plans and procedures to respond, which is what Paul was talking about as one of the most important things to avoid further delay and um, regularly review their cyber security engagements. Um, I think the reasonable endeavours clause to ensure that any third party providing services on its behalf in connection with the contract complies with the terms of the subclause is going to create a lot of practical difficulties. There's a lot of third parties involved um, in um, shipping and who provide services to the vessels which are on charter or so on and um, so I think we will see even by using this clause that this is not a perfect solution by any means and you'll also recall that I said that if we had the um, clause in place then there's a limitation of liability and that's in D there um, and as I mentioned the, the limits are rather low by default bearing in mind the exposure that parties face. So, so depending on the bargaining power, you'd expect that to go up. Um, in terms of how it's going to affect the insurance position, we'll have to wait and see, um, and see whether the clauses like this in the contracts, which seek to allocate the risk, then open up the insurance market so that they're more willing to insure that risk. Just looking at that, I mean, I would have thought from the insurance perspective, the willingness of property insurers in particular to accept that their goods are going to be carried on ships where that limit is within the charter party. Exactly. It's going to be a bit of a question, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. So, so it, it's, it's one solution that's been offered, but whether or not it provides the perfect solution for all the parties that are involved and all the contracts that are involved um, is yet to be tested. So we've talked about the cyber attack compromising um, a port facility. Um, Paul, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about the feasibility of it compromising a ship operational technology and causing an accident in that way. Uh, it's happened. Um, it's in, yes, it's mentioned in uh, the BIMCO guidance. It's already happened. Um, and as I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, there are uh, one, there's one attack on a ship or an, a cyber incident a day. Uh, there's very little that's reported in relation to it, but BIMCO in, in their guidance have made reference to, to one OT attack. Uh, 
Um, so yes, it is, it is happening. This is real. But there's, there's something else that I think it comes out of what Marjorie was saying, also what you were saying, and I think links into James, your introduction about thinking outside the box. Um, one of the things that does occur to me in relation to all of this is ransomware payments. How does that sit in relation to, for example, the GA? I think we have some guidance in relation to what I would call the more traditional piracy. I just wondered whether there were thoughts, James, perhaps in relation to that. Well, I think that's a very good uh, question indeed, Paul, and, and allied to it uh, is, the, is the question of cyber salvage. Uh, suppose you've, you've had a scenario like us and an IT whiz comes on board and, and unlocks the system and defeats the hackers. Could, could that uh, individual or uh, their employer claim salvage? And that's, salvage is probably easier because you could say, well, actually the ship is, was immobilized until assisted and professionally assisted. Um, and that's uh, relatively easy to see. Um, but GA is more difficult. I mean, yes, where the, the ship has been physically taken over by pirates who are bristling with, with weaponry, then uh, that has been accepted for some years now, uh, that where one has paid a ransom, and that's uh, claimable in, in GA from the, the cargo interests. But the, the focus of GA traditionally has very much been on physical risk, and, and there is uh, certainly scope for argument in the authorities, notwithstanding what uh, Mr. Justice Tier had to say in a, in a relatively recent case, for saying that the level of danger, the type of danger that is required to trigger uh, a GA claim is, is different to the type of danger that is sufficient for salvage purposes. Uh, and so I think there could be quite a ticklish question if owners um, paid the, the ransomware demand as to whether the, the maritime adventure was sufficiently imperiled in the, in the conventional sense uh, for general average to be claimable from uh, the uh, cargo owners. That, that's, I think, a really interesting and difficult question. Um, my, my hunch is that uh, it, it would be because the, the, the danger that you're effectively contemplating is a, is a real one. It's not like the ship which is stuck but without being in real danger on the strand in a river, which is the, the classic case where GA was held to be uh, irrecoverable. Um, it, it's, uh, it's more threatening than that. But there is scope for, for argument either way. But that, that then leads on to the question, um, which I'm now going to um, pass like the ball out of the back of the scrum to, uh, to uh, paraphrase our Prime Minister. Um, suppose uh, cyber salvage uh, was, was payable, which insurer would pick up that tab? Over to you, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the honest answer would be, we'd be we'll all be engaged for a very long time working that one out. Um, it's, it's very difficult it's to see difficult, that it's property. It's, it's difficult to see that it's property. Uh, query which liability insurer might might then go for might then look for it, and and query who they would then look uh, for recourse against. Um, and of course, that's before you um, you start unpicking the whole question, uh, which might be the answer. It um, is whose whose exclusions are the more effective? Um, because at the minute, as I come back to, there is no there are as far as I'm aware, there isn't a uniform definition of cyber attack or cyber risk, with it, let alone cyber salvage, um, within the context of um, certainly the maritime industries. Um, all I can say is over to the LOF arbitrators. Sorry, even the demand. Just for the benefit of the recording, uh, two, two questions. I'm just repeating this in case the mics didn't pick it up. Two points uh, are made um, from, uh, from the audience. One is uh, what about payment in cryptocurrency? Uh, and the second is that OFAC has um, warned that uh, payment to uh, sanctioned countries of ransomware uh, would uh, uh, offend them and, and bring the, the, the might of the US sanctions legislation down on the head of whoever has made the payment. 
Um, so that's just for the, the benefit of the, the recording. Uh, and, and I'm going to stay away from the cryptocurrency element of that. Um, but, but, but certainly you have raised another layer of complexity that, that, that we haven't touched on today, which is that if there is, if, if there is any risk that behind the cyber attack is an organization or an individual that is sanctioned, then you are going to bring into play um, the provisions that are now almost uniform, I would have thought, in most forms of insurance cover, uh, which uh, allow the insurer to refuse payment uh, in the event that there is a risk. And it's not, not, not just that it is in breach of sanction, but that there is a risk of it being in breach of sanction. Uh, so, so yes, another, another difficulty uh, in terms of whether or not any ransom will in fact be covered by insurance. And e even if you could persuade a bank to make the payment, which yeah. is probably the, the more the more difficult the more difficult problem. We've had a couple of other questions. Um, returning back to on board the ship, um, rather than um, insurance. I've got your back here, Nigel. It's not for you. Uh, <laughs> to James, the other side of the room. Um, in our scenario, the question starts, we've got one action which should be considered negligent in any IT scenario, allowing the USB stick to be allowed on board. So does this mean that cyber seamanship rules were neglected? But I think that raises the sort of preliminary question, will we see the introduction of cyber seamanship rules built into um, vessels SMS? Well, they're there already now. I think they have to be. Um, and uh, the, the, the answer to the question, I'm finally going to answer a question. I would say yes, simply taking a, a USB stick um, from a, a, a third party contractor and putting it into your system is, is totally negligent. Um, I say that confident that there are probably people in the room who've done just that. Um, but uh, there, there can't really be any serious doubt about that. The question, of course, on the facts of our case would be whether that was causative. What, you know, where did, where did the relevant um, uh, malicious code come from? Did it come from the computer that was plugged into the system? Did it come from the USB stick? Did it come from an email? Uh, and that, uh, unless and until the systems are unlocked, uh, could be enormously difficult to establish. I, I would, I mean, I'd just add in relation to that, I think training is incredibly important. We've seen it, for example, with ISM and the cases that have arisen out of ISM. And although I think it's fair to say that the law does generally lag behind technology, we are well equipped with the law just to look back and to be guided by those cases in relation to what could be expected going forward. Yeah. Um, I've had a message from um, she who must be obeyed, who says it's time to wrap up. So I think Paul, you're going to do the wrap yes. up. I have the honour of, of doing the wrap up. Um, well, I think first of all, that we've had some very illuminating presentations and also some great Q and A. Um, as I think all of us recognise, uh, cyber is real. And as I've mentioned, the law does generally lag behind technology. Um, but I do believe we're, we're well equipped in order to be able to meet the challenges which uh, are ahead of us. Um, I want to say various thank yous. Thank you very much to everybody here. Um, this is the first time I've given uh, an in-person presentation for over 18 months. Um, so that's great. Uh, thank you also to those who are online. And thank you also, of course, to Quadrant for hosting um, what has been, I think, a, an excellent uh, event. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.